Kathy Wood of ARK Invest has some thoughts on Tesla specifically relating to their robo-taxi launch in June. Mother, f- I won't finish that. You know how it goes. Mm. Uh, Tesla, uh, we believe, will have... Uh, a, a lock on the robo taxi business in the U.S. First robo taxis launching in Austin in June, and we believe they're going to proliferate through the United States, especially if we move regulation from a, a state level to federal level, which we believe will happen. Uh, is going to proliferate through the United States, I think, more quickly than many people expect. Many people don't expect it at all. <laughs> no, Kathy's actually laughing at the thought that. A lot of folks don't even expect Tesla to widely scale their robotaxi fleet in the US. But she does make an important point. This service will proliferate, aka scale, much faster than most people think. The good news is it's not like autonomy at scale is a massive multi, 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 multi multi-trillion dollar opportunity. So even if people underestimate how quickly it happens or how large the slice Tesla will take, it's not like they'll regret that. So that's that's going to be easy to beat. Uh, So yes, it did hurt, but what also hurt was macros. All automakers, until this uh, tariff swoosh, you know, to get ahead of tariffs, all automakers have been suffering, and and especially in the first quarter. Um, the new cycle passes quickly in the United States, and uh, now that Elon is stepping somewhat aside, not which you, completely. Which you welcome. Um, yeah, no, I think I, I think the shock value of what he did was important, and now he's got a, a team in place that is going to follow through. And, and the way that Elon, uh, Elon works mm-hmm. is he sets milestones and and time time frames, uh, and when but he they, often doesn't meet when they are not met. He goes in and becomes ultra focused, and you know you you hear about the mass layoffs and and all of that. So, is there a concern to you in your mind around? I mean, we talk a lot about dec- legacy media can't help themselves. Is there a concern about? Are you worried about? Should investors be fearful of? Let's wrap this one here. A new interview with Elon Musk in just a sec. But first, Kathy Wood talking about the short term slowdown in terms of the vehicle market in general. We'll check this out. U.S. electric vehicle registrations. In March, on screen now, no prizes for guessing who's number one with a truly astonishing gap ahead of second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and sixty ninth place. Over 50,000 Tesla vehicles registered in the US in March. Second place, just shy of 8,500 Chevrolet, followed by Ford, just over 7,000. Hyundai, a bit over 5,500. BMW, same vicinity. Rivian, a little over 4,000. So Tesla outselling Rivian in the US in March. More than 10 to 1, followed by Cadillac, just over 3,000. Mercedes-Benz, under 3,000. Honda, under 3,000. Kia, just over 2,500. Audi, under 2,500. I guess this is what it looks like when the competition comes. Embarrassingly fast, all over themselves, not for Tesla. And speaking of embarrassing and the so-called competition, I saw this amusing reminder from John on X. On this day in 2009, Daimler, aka Mercedes-Benz Group, buys nearly 10% of Tesla for $50 million. By 2014, it had sold all of its shares for less than a billion dollars. And today, a 10% stake in Tesla is worth well in excess of $100 billion. And uh, should we? Yeah, we'll do it. Today, the Mercedes-Benz Group has a market cap of just over 50 billion euros, around 57 billion US dollars. Turns out Daimler's sale of their near 10% stake in Tesla was certainly quite a financial education. They still held this. Just their stake in Tesla will be worth roughly twice the entire market cap of the company today. Wow. But don't worry, it's not like Daimler slash Mercedes-Benz needed Tesla or any insights or technology to have a dominant lead in terms of electric vehicles. They're doing just fine on their own. As we can see in the US, registering 2,883 electric vehicles in March to Tesla's mere 51,042. Nice. Now Elon's latest interview with Microsoft's leader, P.S. Scam Altman has left the chat. Thank you so much, Elon, for being here at Build. I know you started off uh, as an intern at Microsoft. You were a Windows developer, and of course, you're a big PC gamer still. Uh, You want to just talk about even your early days with uh, Windows and the kinds of things you built? Uh, Yeah, well, actually started before Windows with DOS. Um, I had one of the early uh, IBM PCs with uh, MS-DOS, and... um, I think it had like 128K in the beginning and then it doubled to 256K, which felt like a lot. Um, so I, yeah, I programmed video games in DOS and then um, later in, in uh, 
Windows. Uh, remember Windows uh, 3.1? Yeah. Now, I'm showing my age here, but bro, I remember the massive shift with Windows 3.1 as well. I'd always wondered at the time, I'm sure there was a Windows 1 and a 2, but my perception was we just went directly from MS-DOS to Windows 3.1, which is a massive, massive change. For those who don't know, MS-DOS was just purely text-based. You needed to be extremely autistic to operate a computer prior to Windows 3.1. And I mean like super autistic, zero exceptions. If anyone else was around during this time, can you explain to me why my brain remembers us going directly from MS-DOS to Windows 3.1? No Windows 1 or 2 or 3, just straight to 3.1. Prior to then, for the record, for what it's worth, I was a pretty young kid at the time, but I was playing games on my computer. My dad had actually programmed me a Windows-esque interface just to access games on the hard drive because I had no idea how to operate MS-DOS. It was extremely basic. Colored boxes that would stack one on top of another. I think it was about 10 games based on how they appeared on the hard drive and like a more or a next button to pop up the next 10 games. But again, someone explained to me, how did, like, why is my perception we just went straight from MS-DOS to Windows 3.1? What happened with Windows 1 and 2? How did 3.1 become the big breakthrough? Anyway, thank fuck for my old man. Otherwise, I'd never experienced the joy of playing Commander Keen, episodes one through four, I think. Lemmings, the original Duke Nukem. No, it's wonderful. I mean, I even uh, the last time I chatted with you, you were talking all about everything, the intricacies of Active Directory. And, and so it's fantastic uh, to have you at our developer conference. Obviously, the exciting thing for us is to be able to launch Grok uh, on Azure. I know uh, you have a deep vision for what AI needs to be, and that's what got you to get this built. Uh, it's a family of models that are both response and reasoning models, and you have a very exciting roadmap. You want to just tell us a little bit about sort of your vision, the capability. You're pushing on both capability and efficiency, so maybe you can just talk about a little bit of that. Sure. So, yeah, with, with, with Grok, especially with Grok 3.5 that uh, is about to be released, um, it's, tr it's trying to reason from first principles, so apply kind of the, uh, the the tools of physics to uh, to thinking. Um, so um, if you're trying to get to fundamental truths, you you try to, you, you boil things down to the the axiomatic elements that are most likely to be correct, uh, and then you reason up from there, and then you can test your conclusions against those axiomatic elements. And you know, in physics, if if you violate conservation of energy or momentum, then you're you're either going to get a Nobel Prize or you're you're wrong, and and you're almost certainly wrong, uh, basically. So. Um, so, so the, 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 that's really the focus of, of Grok 3.5 is um, uh, sort of a fund, fundamentals of physics um, and, and applying physics tools across uh, all lines of reasoning um, and to aspire to truth with uh, minimal error. Like there's always going to be some mistakes that are made, uh, but we aim to, to uh, get to truth with acknowledged error, uh, but minimize that error over time. And um, I think that's actually extremely important for uh, AI safety. Um, so I've thought a lot for a long time about AI safety, and my ultimate conclusion is the the old maxim that honesty is the best policy. Uh, it it really really is for for safety. Um, but I do want to emphasize, you know, we 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 have and will make mistakes, but we aspire to correct them very quickly. Um, and we we are very much looking forward to feedback from the developer community to say like, what do you need? Where are we wrong? How can we make it better? Um, and to to have Grok be something that the developer community community uh, is very excited to use, and where they can feel that their feedback is being uh, heard, and uh, and Grok is is improving and uh, serving their needs. Yeah, I know it's in some sense, you know, cracking the physics of intelligence is perhaps the real goal uh, for us to be able to use AI uh, at scale. And so it's so good to you know take that first principles approach that you and your team are taking. And also you're deploying this. I mean, one of the things about sort of what you do is uh, you're doing, you know, unsupervised FSD on one side, you're doing robotics, of course, there's Grok. So you're deploying Grok across all of your businesses from SpaceX to Tesla, obviously at X. Uh, I would love to even... You know, one of the themes for this developer conference, uh, Elon, is we're building pretty sophisticated AI apps, right? It's not even about any one model. It's about orchestrating multiple models, multiple agents. Uh, just anything that you are seeing in the real world application side, even inside of your own companies, when you think about even a Tesla or a SpaceX, where you put Grok and these the other uh, AI models you're building? Yeah, it, it's incredibly important uh, for an AI model to be grounded in reality. Uh, reality, you know, um, I was saying, which is like, like physics is the law and everything else is a recommendation, which is, I'm not suggesting people break the, 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 the laws made by, you know, humans, uh, you know, we, we should generally obey the laws of, 
humans, but but I've seen many people break uh, human-made laws, but I have not seen anyone break uh, the laws of physics. Um, so for, for, for any given AI, grounding it against reality, um, and reality, for example, as you mentioned, with, with co the car needs to drive safely and correctly, uh, the uh, humanoid robot uh, Optimus needs to you know, perform the task that, that, that it's being asked to perform. Um, the, these, uh, these, these are things that are very, very helpful for uh, ensuring that the model is uh, truthful and accurate um, because it has to adhere to the laws of physics. So, so I think that's actually maybe uh, so, some, somewhat overlooked or at least not talked about it enough is that it, to really be intelligent, it's, it's, it's got to make predictions that are in line with reality, of, in other words, physics. Uh, that's that's it's a really fundamental thing, um, and um, and being able to ground that uh, with uh, cars and robots is is very important. Um, we are, we are seeing uh, Grok be very helpful in things like customer service, um, and um, you know the, the AI is infinitely patient and friendly, and you can yell at it, and it's still going to be very nice uh, <laughs> as long as it doesn't become sentient and have a very long memory. I'm kidding, or am I? But actually, Musk does have an important point. LLMs, including voice based language models for customer service are a perfect fit at least until grok becomes fully self-aware grok ain't going to get butt hurt if you're a little impatient or rude although i highly recommend being polite anyway because i suspect ai does have a pretty good memory and again i have to say this i've been saying it now for a year plus but if you're not using language models daily in your own personal and professional life you're fucking up minutes before i was recording this very video i was having a long form conversation with grok the latest model if anyone wants to know the details, I was actually describing things that could affect pulse wave velocity. Very nerdy discussion. Most of you probably don't know what that is or don't care. We had a lot of back and forth. I learned a huge amount of value. A lot of citations as well. Grok just wasn't spitting out random shit at me that I couldn't verify or validate. I literally use LLMs multiple times every single day in both my personal and professional life. If you're not doing the same, you are making a massive mistake. Grok, for example, is endlessly useful. And it's not just when it comes to personal development, health-related things, your professional life, even for entertainment. Like if you're looking for a new film to watch, you go, hey, Grok, here's my top 10 favorite films and here's why I like them. Can you please recommend more that I might like? Hey, Grok, my girlfriend's getting fat. How do I tell her she's getting fat without her getting butt hurt, crying, and then eating ice cream to feel better and getting even fatter? I'm not sure how Grok's advice would go there, but hey, it's worth a try. Or you could always just ask the question and then leave the chat open for her to find. <laughs> <laughs> don't actually do that it's not a good idea again back to the point though you've got to be using language models daily if you're not you're really missing out it can save a huge amount of time a huge amount of mental energy help enormously with research ideas anything the key is just knowing the questions to ask and if you're not doing this you will be left behind <laughs> so that's good um yeah and, and so um so I, I think in terms of improving the quality of customer service and sort of issue resolution um, uh, AI is already, uh, Grok is already doing quite a good job of that at SpaceX and Tesla. And, um, and we, we look forward to like offering that to, to other companies. No, that's fantastic. Uh, really thrilled uh, to get this journey started, getting that developer feedback, uh, and then looking forward to even how they deploy. There is these language models. There's, you know, I think over time, we will have this coming together of language models with vision, with action. But Spoiler alert, yeah, that's how a GI, artificial general intelligence, arises, coming together of all these disparate models. The two core components, really, real-world AI, embodied AI. The key here is vision, seeing, perceiving, planning, and acting, as in moving, interacting in the real world. That's piece number one. That's really challenging. Collecting that data, solving vision, enormously difficult. The second piece is language, is cognition in general. Superintelligent AI, language-based AI, plus real-world AI equals the two core ingredients for artificial general and then artificial superintelligence. And by the way, just on a quick side note, if there are any companies that just so happened to have potential partnerships, maybe common founders and or leaders, exclusive proprietary data streams, for example, a data stream that's essentially solved real-world, e.g. vision, and also proprietary language-based data stream that also obviously includes pictures and videos. There could be a potential partnership between those two entities. Maybe you'd call one of them Tesla, just hypothetically, of course, with real-world AI. This is all just a made-up scenario, of course. Tesla, real-world AI, embodied AI, having sole vision. And then you might call another company, let's just say X, which has a real-world, real-time data stream of text, images, and video for language. And then you might have another company called XAI that's tapped into the X data stream 
to solve the language element. And then maybe these three entities could somehow bring these technologies together and suddenly you've got artificial general intelligence. All hypothetical, of course. But to your point, being really grounded on a real world model. Um, and that, I think, is ultimately the goal here. And so thank you so much, Elon, uh, for briefly joining us today. And we're really excited about working with you and getting this into the developers' hands. Thank, thank you very much. And I can't, I can't emphasize enough that we're looking for feedback from you, the developer audience. Uh, tell us what, what, what you want and we'll, we'll make it happen. Thank you. So I do wonder how Scam Altman will feel about his sugar daddy over at Microsoft and this new relationship with Grok and XAI. Big things happening in the world of AI, folks. P.S. June, motherfuckers. Want more content? Early access? Bunch of perks? Click the links in the pinned comment. AG1 is awesome. I've been taking it daily now for more than three years. It's a great way to fill in nutritional gaps. It's packed full of vitamins, minerals, and whole food source nutrients. Plus, it has prebiotics, probiotics, and adaptogens to improve gut health, regularity, and help your body handle stress. I'm always looking for an edge to help me feel and perform my best, which is why I haven't missed a day of AG1 for more than three years. Just try it and see how you feel. Click the link in the pinned comment or head to drinkag1.com slash SMR and get yourself a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five travel packs.